Hello, folks. How's everybody doing tonight? Can as, can everybody hear me? Give me some W's, 1's, thumbs up in the chat, whatever you'd like. Just let me know you guys can hear me. <clears throat> Sorry, I had a little bit of a mistake. Started the wrong live stream. When I, when I was originally starting the live stream and whatnot. Sorry, I heard my uh, my other audio coming through here by accident. Didn't mean for that. Alright, sounds like everyone can hear me and whatnot. <clears throat> Hello to everybody over on Twitch. Give me just a second so I can get TikTok started and get TikTok looped into this. Everybody's getting roped into this. Well, he roped me into this. Give me one second here. <clears throat> all right, folks, give me just one second to adjust the lighting. Make sure we're all good. Ow, he wrote me into this. Yeah, I'm sure you can probably see my eyes and whatnot through the mask sometimes. If the lighting is just right, that's why I'm trying not to get the lighting too... What? Too... You know, revealing. I'd rather not you know, expose my face if I can avoid it. So perhaps I'll shift the light a little bit. But hello, thank you guys all for hopping in here. <clears throat> uh, I will be starting tonight. I'm going to try to uh, not get interrupted as much if I can while reading. Maybe one day I'll get a new mask. Um, just so that way... I'm sorry, I have ADHD, so it's not that easy. <laughs> but uh, just so that way we can stay focused and uh, do that. And then we'll tr I'll try to talk to some folks and whatnot throughout po certain points. Um, hello to everybody hopping in the TikTok. Hi, folks. How are you all doing today? Um, give me just one moment here and we will get started. <clears throat> exactly, Castle Rook. See, Castle Rook gets it. Um, let's see here. Can I adjust you guys a little bit? Yeah. Shoot. Okay. Not how I wanted to do this originally. Uh, my charger came undone and everything. Uh, give me one second here. There we go. This way. Or wait. I have a little box here that I use to prop up my phone when I record videos. Hopefully, this way, it's a little easier for you guys to see me and there we go alrighty <clears throat> so everybody doing good everybody having a good night before I get started here Old school RuneScape. I'll definitely check that out at some point. Grim, you're definitely right. It's a very good book. And we're actually going to get to one of the most compelling chapters of the book tonight. Which is The Main Road. <clears throat> which is where we'll be starting. It's your boy Will here. Everybody, thank you all for joining tonight. Got quite a few people in both Twitch, YouTube... TikTok. So everybody, hi. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you all enjoy. <clears throat> so the fourth iteration, uh, again, all the iterations have a sort of uh, pattern to them, and that pattern continues to grow and unfold as the book goes on. Um, and then there's a quote from Malcolm at the middle, or at the bottom. The, uh, the quote from Malcolm this time is, 
inevitably underlying instabilities begin to appear. And this is what the drawing looks like this time. Here's TikTok, and <clears throat> oh, shoot, folks! Sorry, I tried to move the lamp. Give me one second, TikTok. I'll get you fixed. Sorry, folks. One second here. I just got to get... Everything wasn't as situated as I hoped it would be. My complete bad. <clears throat> Move that there. So sorry. Give me just two seconds. Alrighty. Hello to everybody here on TikTok. Sorry about that. Hello to everybody on Twitch and YouTube. I am back again. Sorry about that whole situation. Unfortunate. My, my phone got unplugged. It was a whole thing. My phone's already kind of dying. So I don't want that to die or crash or anything. Hello to everybody on TikTok. I see a whole bunch of people joining and leaving, so hello to everybody joining and goodbye to everybody leaving. Um, but without m too much further ado, let's get this started so that way we don't get too much more off track. <clears throat> all right, all right, all right. Uh, da, da, da. <clears throat> What is this? What, what is it telling me to do? Oh, perfect. It lets me see the chat. All right. I guess I do have to pull this out slightly so I can see a little bit better. Because believe it or not, not the easiest to see. Oh, you know what? Duh. This will help. So the ch chapter is, of course, as I mentioned, titled The Main Road. You might be able to see my eyes at various points. <clears throat> Rain drummed loudly on the roof of the Land Cruiser. Dang, I was really hoping to have it dark in here, but I can't see well enough, unfortunately, for it to stay dark. So we're just gonna pop another lamp on so I can see a little better. Goodbye to everybody leaving, hello to everybody joining, and let's actually get started here. So, so sorry about all this. Rain drummed loudly on the roof of the Land Cruiser. Tim felt the night vision goggles pressing heavily on his forehead. He reached for the knob near his ear and adjusted the intensity. There was a brief phosphorescent flare, and then, in shades of electronic green and black, he could see the Land Cruiser behind, with Dr. Grant and Dr. Malcolm inside. Neat! Dr. Grant was staring out the front windshield behind him, or toward him. Tim saw him pick up the radio from the dash. There was a burst of static, and then he heard Dr. Grant's voice. Can you see us back here? <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry! That all got me a little stressed out before the start of the video. Hello to everybody got hopping in here. Can you see us back here? Tim picked up the radio from Rodriguez. I see you. Everything all right? We're fine, Dr. Grant. Stay in the car. We will. Don't worry. He clicked the radio off. Rodriguez snorted. It's pouring down rain. Of course we'll stay in the car, he muttered. Tim turned back to look at the foliage on the side of the road. Through the goggles, the foliage was a bright electronic green, and beyond, he could see the sections of the green grid pattern of the fence. The Land Cruisers were stopped on the downslope of a hill, which must mean they were someplace near the Tyrannosaur area. It would be amazing to see a Tyrannosaur with these night vision goggles. A real thrill. 
Maybe the Tyrannosaur would come to the fence and look over at them. Tim wondered if its eyes would glow in the dark when he saw them. That would be neat. But he didn't see anything, and eventually he stopped looking. Everyone in the cars fell silent. The rain thrummed on the roof of the car. Sheets of water streamed down over the sides of the windows. It was hard for Tim to see out, even with the goggles on. How long have we been sitting here? Malcolm asked. I don't know, four or five minutes? I wonder what the problem is. Maybe a short circuit from the rain. So, obviously, this is being told mainly from the perspective of Tim. And you gotta remember, Tim, of course, just like Lex, is a child. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. <clears throat> Sorry, I see a whole bunch of folks here chatting and whatnot. <laughs> thank you, Grim. But it happened before the rain really started. There was another silence. In a tense voice, Lex said, But there's no lightning, right? She had always been afraid of lightning. And she, and she now sat nervously squeezing her leather mitt in her hands. Dr. Grant said, What was that? We didn't quite read that. Just my sister talking. Oh. Tim again scanned the foliage, but saw nothing. Certainly nothing as big as the Tyrannosaur. He began to wonder if the Tyrannosaurs came out at night. Were they nocturnal animals? Tim wasn't sure if he had ever heard that. He had the feeling that Tyrannosaurs were all weather, day or night animals. The time of, the time of day didn't matter to a Tyrannosaur. <clears throat> the rain continued to pour. Hell of a rain, Nyriga said. It's really coming down. Lex said, I'm hungry. I know that, Lex, Riga said. But we're stuck here, sweetie. The cars run on electricity buried in cables in the mud. Or in the road, sorry. Stuck for how long? Until they fix the electricity. Listening to the sound of the rain, Tim felt himself growing sleepy. He yawned and turned to look at the palm tree on the left side of the road and was startled by a sudden thump as the ground shook. He swung back just in time to catch a glimpse of a dark shape as it swiftly crossed the road between the two cars. Jesus, what was that? It was huge. It was as big as the car. Tim, are you there? He picked up the radio. Yes, I'm here. Did you see it, Tim? No, Tim said. I missed it. What the hell was it? Malcolm asked. Are you wearing the night vision goggles, Tim? Yes, I'll watch. Was it the Tyrannosaur? Edrigus asked. I don't think so. It was in the road. But you didn't see it, Edrigus said. No. Tim felt bad that he had missed seeing the animal, whatever it was. There was a sudden white crack of lightning. Oh, shoot. My bad. There was a sudden white crack of lightning, and his night vision goggles flared bright green. He blinked his eyes and started counting. One one thousand. Two one thousand. The thunder crashed, deafeningly loud and very close. Lex began to cry. Oh no. Take it easy, honey, Enrique said. It was just lightning. Tim scanned the side of the road. The rain was coming down hard. Hard now, shaking the leaves with hammering drops. It made everything move. Everything seemed alive. He scanned the leaves. He stopped. There was something beyond the leaves. <clears throat> Tim looked up, higher, beyond, behind the foliage, beyond the fence, he saw a thick body with a pebbled, grainy surface, like the bark of a tree. But it wasn't a tree. He continued to look higher, sweeping the goggles upward. He saw the huge head of the Tyrannosaur, just standing there, looking over the fence at the two land cruisers. The lightning flashed again and the big animal rolled its head and bellowed in the glaring light. Then darkness and silence again and pounding rain. Sorry, I'm not good at timing these, uh, these sound effects. <clears throat> We're figuring it out. We're figuring it out. We'll get there. We'll get there. <clears throat> Miguel, thanks for subscribing. Oh, jeez. 
Diesel, thank you very much for the uh, for the gifted sub. Give me some W's for Diesel. Um, sorry, I forgot. I already broke my own rule. I'm gonna try to thank everyone who do, does gifts and whatnot in between chapters, just so that way we give a less interrupted reading experience. I'm so sorry for breaking my own rule already. I forgot to actually say that. Hello, Diesel. Thank you for hopping in here very much. I don't want to um, downplay the it at all, and I will thank you more properly um, once I read a little bit further. So sorry about that. I, I promise I will thank you in a more proper manner. In a more polite manner, I should say. Hi, Henry. Thank you for hopping in here as well. Thank you for everyone in Twitch, everyone on YouTube, and everyone on TikTok for hopping in and joining me tonight. It is much appreciated and much love to all you guys. <clears throat> I'm trying to go through all three chats and read a little bit of you guys at the same time. Thank you for the gifts on all platforms. I see, I see a couple of you guys sending roses on TikTok and I do appreciate it. But let's get back to the reading. <clears throat> then darkness and silence again and the pounding rain. Tim? Yes, Dr. Grant. Sorry, I forgot that I had the thunder going still too. Whoopsie. All right. Tim? Yes, Dr. Grant. You see what it is? Yes, Dr. Grant. Tim had a sense that Dr. Grant was trying to talk in a way that wouldn't upset his sister. What's going on right now? Nothing, Tim said, watching the Tyrannosaur through his night vision goggles, just standing on the other side of the fence. I can't see much from here, Tim. I can see fine, Dr. Grant. It's just standing there. Okay. Lex continued to cry, snuffling. There was another pause. Tim watched the Tyrannosaur. The head was huge. The animal looked from one vehicle to another, then back again. It seemed to stare right at Tim. In the goggles, the eyes glowed bright green. Tim felt a chill, but then, as he looked down the animal's body, moving down from the massive head and jaw, he saw the smaller, muscular foreland. It waved in the air, and then it gripped the fence. Jesus Christ, Edriga said, staring out the window. <clears throat> and then we're moving over to Edriga's vision now. Sorry. The paint on this book seems to come off a little bit, so I keep trying to make sure it doesn't get on my hands. The greatest predator the world had ever known. The most fearsome attack in human history. Somewhere in the back of his publicist brain, Ed Regis was still writing copy, but he could feel his knees begin to shake uncontrollably, his trousers flapping like flags. Jesus, he was frightened. He didn't want to be here. Alone among all the people in the two cars, Ed Regis knew what a dinosaur attack was like. He knew what happened to people. He had seen the mangled bodies that resulted from the raptor attacks. He could picture it in his mind. And this was a Rex. Much, much bigger. The greatest meat eater that had ever walked the earth. Jesus. When the Rex roared, it was a terrifying scream. Something that came from another world. Ed Regis felt the spreading warmth in his trousers. He'd peed his pants. He couldn't just stay here. He had to do something. Something. His hands were shaking and trembling against the dash. He was embarrassed and terrified. Jesus Christ, he said again. So, we're going back to Tim's perspective now. Leaving Ed Regis behind a little bit. <clears throat> Sorry, I know you folks on uh, TikTok can't hear the sound effects, unfortunately. Um, but if, uh, if you guys are watching on TikTok and you're enjoying this, but you do want the sound effects, you guys can hop on Twitch or YouTube. I'm streaming on both of those platforms right now as well. Give me one second here, guys. Just uh, readjusting everything. <clears throat> oh dear. I hope everyone is enjoying so far. Let me just make sure everything looks good. Yeah, it looks like we're looking good for the most part. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Bad language, Lex said, wagging her finger at him. 
Tim heard the sound of the door opening, and he swung his head away from the Tyrannosaur. The night vision goggles streaked laterally, in time to see Ed Regis stepping out through the open door, ducking his head in the rain. Hey, Lex said, where are you going? Ed Regis just turned and ran in the opposite direction from the Tyrannosaur, disappearing into the woods. The door to the Land Cruiser hung open. The paneling was getting wet. He left, Lex said. Where did he go? He left us alone. Shut the door, Tim said, but, he, but she had started to scream. He left us. He left us. Tim, what's going on? It was Dr. Grant on the radio. Tim. Tim leaned forward and tried to shut the door. From the back seat, he couldn't reach the handle. He looked back to the Tyrannosaur as lightning flashed again, momentarily silhouetting the black shape against the white flaring sky. Tim, what's happening? He left us. He left us. Tim blinked to recover his vision. When he looked again, the Tyrannosaur was standing there, exactly as before, motionless and huge. Rain dripped from its jaws, and its forelimb gripped the fence. <clears throat> the fence, and then, Tim realized, the Tyrannosaur was holding on to the fence. The fence wasn't electrified anymore. Lex, close the door! The, the radio crackled. Tim! I'm here, Dr. I'm here, Dr. Grant. What's going on? Regus ran away, Tim said. He what? He ran away. I think he saw that the fence isn't electrified anymore, Tim replied. The fence isn't electrified, Malcolm asked, over the radio. Did he say the fence isn't electrified? Lex, Tim said, close the door. But Lex was screaming, he left us, he left us, in a steady, monotonous wail. And there was nothing for Tim to do but climb out of the back door into the slashing rain and shut the door for her. Thunder rumbled and the lightning flashed again. And Tim looked up and saw the Tyrannosaur crashing down the cyclone fence with a giant hind limb. Timmy! He jumped back in and slammed the door. The sound lost in the thunderclap. The radio. Tim, are you there? He grabbed the radio. I'm here. He turned to Lex. Lock the door, get in the middle of the car, and shut up. Outside, the Tyrannosaur rolled its head and took an awkward step forward. The claws of its feet had caught in the grid of the flattened fence. Lex saw the animal finally and became silent. And still, she watched with wide eyes. The radio crackled. Tim, yes, Dr. Grant, stay in the car, stay down, be quiet, don't move, and don't make noise. Okay, should be all right. Don't think it can open the car. Okay, just stay quiet so you don't arouse its attention any more than necessary. Okay, Tim clicked the radio off. You hear that, Lex? His sister nodded silently. She never took her eyes off the dinosaur. <clears throat> the Tyrannosaur roared. In the glare of lightning, they saw it pull free of the fence and take a bounding step forward. Sorry, once again, trying to get these sound effects to time right. Doesn't always time right, I apologize. <clears throat> oh. Give me un momento. Just adjusting everything here again? Okay, perfect. Now it was standing between the two cars. Tim couldn't see Dr. Grant's car anymore because the huge body blocked his view. The rain ran in rivulets down the pebbled skin of the muscular hind legs. He couldn't see the animal's head, which was high above the roof line. The Tyrannosaur moved around the side of their car. It went to the very spot where Tim had gotten out of the car to close the door, where Ed Regis had gotten out of the car. The animal paused there. The big head ducked down toward the mud. Tim looked back at Dr. Grant and Dr. Malcolm in the rear car. Their faces were tense as they stared forward through the windshield. The huge head raised back up, jaws open, and then stopped by the side windows. In the glare of lightning, they saw the beady, expressionless reptile eye moving in the socket. It was looking 
in the car. His sister's breath came in ragged, frightened gasps. He reached out and squeezed her arm, hoping she would stay quiet. The dinosaur continued to stare for a long time through the side window. Perhaps the dinosaur couldn't really see them, he thought. Finally, the head lifted up, out of view again. Timmy, Lex whispered. It's okay, Tim whispered. I don't think it saw us. He was looking back toward Dr. Grant when a jolting impact rocked the Land Cruiser and shattered the windshield in a spider web as the Tyrannosaur's head crashed against the hood of the Land Cruiser. <clears throat> Sorry. Tyrannosaur's head crashed against the hood. Tim was knocked flat on the seat. The night vision goggles slid off his forehead. <coughs> he got back up quickly, blinking in the darkness, his mouth warm with blood. Lex? He couldn't see his sister anywhere. The Tyrannosaur stood near the front of the Land Cruiser, its chest moving as it breathed, the forelimbs making clawing movements in the air. Lex! Tim whispered. Then he heard her groan. She was lying somewhere on the floor underneath the front seat. Then the huge head came down, entirely blocking the shattered windshield. The Tyrannosaur banged again on the front hood of the Land Cruiser. Tim grabbed the seat as the car rocked on its wheels. The Tyrannosaur banged down twice more, denting the metal. Then it moved around the side of the car. The big, raised tail blocked most of his view out of all the side windows. At the back, the animal snorted a deep, rumbling growl that blended with the thunder. Sort of like this. It sank its jaws into the spare tire mounted on the back of the Land Cruiser, and in a single shake, tore it away. The rest of the car lifted into the air for a moment, and then it thumped down with a muddy splash. <clears throat> Tim, Dr. Grant said. Tim, are you there? Tim grabbed the radio. We're okay, he said. There was a shrill metallic scrape as, as the claws raked the roof of the car. Tim's heart was pounding in his chest. He couldn't see anything out of the windows on the right side except pebbled leathery flesh. The Tyrannosaur was leaning against the car, which rocked back and forth with each breath, the springs and metal creaking loudly. Lex groaned again. Tim put down the radio and started to crawl into the front seat. The Tyrannosaur roared and the metal roof dented downwards. Tim felt a sharp pain in his head and tumbled to the floor onto the transmission hump. He found himself lying alongside Lex, and he was shocked to see that the whole side of her head was covered in blood. She looked unconscious. There was another jolting impact, and pieces of glass fell all around him. Tim felt rain. He looked up and saw that the front windshield had broken out. There was just a jagged rim of glass, and beyond, the big head of the dinosaur, looking down at him. Tim felt a sudden chill, and then the head rushed forward toward him, the jaws open. There was a squeal of metal against teeth, and he felt the hot, stinking breath of the animal, and a thick tongue stuck into the car through the windshield opening. The tongue slapped around wetly inside the car, and he felt the hot lather of dinosaur saliva, and the tyrannosaur roared, a deafening sound inside the car. The head pulled away abruptly. Oop. The head pulled a the head pulled away abruptly. Tim scrambled up, avoiding the dent in the roof. There was still room to sit on, on the front seat by the passenger door. The Tyrannosaur stood in the rain near the front fender, but it seemed confused by what had happened to it. Blood dripped freely from its jaws. The Tyrannosaur looked at Tim, cocking its head side to stare with one big eye. The head moved closer to the car sideways and peered in. Blood spattered on the dented hood of the Land Cruiser, mixing with the rain. It can't get to me, Tim thought. It's too big. <clears throat> then the head pulled away, and in the flare of lightning, he saw the hind leg lift up, and the world tilted crazily as the Land Cruiser slammed over on its side, and the window splatting in the mud. He saw Lex fall helplessly against the side window, and he fell down beside her, 
banging his head. Tim felt dizzy, and then the Tyrannosaur's jaws clamped onto the window frame, and the whole Land Cruiser was lifted up into the air and shaken. Timmy! Lex shrieked so near to his ear that it hurt. She was suddenly awake, and he grabbed her as the Tyrannosaur crashed the car down again. Tim felt a stabbing pain in his side, and his sister fell on top of him. The car went again, tilting crazily. Lex shouted, Timmy! And he saw the door give way beneath her, and she fell out of the car into the mud. But Tim couldn't answer, because in the next instant, everything swung crazily. He saw the trunks of palm trees sliding past him, moving sideways through the air. He glimpsed the ground very far below, the hot roar of the Tyrannosaur, the blazing eye, the tops of the palm trees, and then, with a metallic scraping shriek, the car fell from the Tyrannosaur's jaws, a sickening fall, and Tim's stomach heaved in the moment before the world became totally black and silent. <clears throat> Sorry, that one, that, that little bit of dialogue took a bit out of me. Whew. But that's, that's, I hope you guys are enjoying I, I, I hope that was good for you. Give me one second here. We'll continue that chapter. That's not nowhere near the end. Uh, <clears throat> in the other Malcolm, in the other car, Malcolm gasped. Jesus, what happened to the car? Grant blinked his eyes as the lightning faded. The other car was gone. Grant couldn't believe it. Believed it? Believe it. He peered forward, trying to see through the rain-streaked windshield. The dinosaur's body was so large, it was probably just blocking... No. In another flash of lightning, he saw clearly. The car was gone. <clears throat> what happened, Malcolm said. I don't know. Finally, over the rain, Grant heard the sound of the little girl screaming. The dinosaur was standing in the darkness on the road was standing in darkness on the road up ahead, but they could see well enough to know that it was bending over now, sniffing the ground. <clears throat> or eating something on the ground. Can you see? Malcolm said, squinting. Not much, no, Grant said. The rain pounded on the roof of the car. He listened for the little girl, but he didn't hear her anymore. The two men just sat in the car, listening. Was it the girl? Malcolm said finally. It sounded like the girl. It did, yes. Was it? I don't know, Grant said. He felt a seeping fatigue overtake him. Blurred through the rainy windshield, the dinosaur was coming towards their car now. Slow, ominous strides, coming right toward them. Malcolm said, you know, it's times like these that one feels, well, perhaps extinct animals should be left extinct. Don't you have that feeling now? Yes, Grant said. He was feeling his heart pounding. Um, do you, uh, have any suggestions about what we do now? I can't think of a thing, Grant said. Malcolm twisted the handle, kicked open the door, and ran. But even as he did, Grant could see that he was too late, the Tyrannosaur too close. There was another crack of lightning, and in that instance of glaring white light, Grant watched in horror as the Tyrannosaur roared and leapt forward. Grant was not clear about exactly what happened next. Malcolm was running, his feet splashing in the mud. The Tyrannosaur bounded alongside him and ducked his massive head, and Malcolm was tossed into the air like a small doll. <clears throat> But th by then, Grant was out of the car, too, feeling the cold rain slashing his face and body. Sorry. The Tyrannosaur had turned its back to him, the huge tail swinging through the air. Grant was tensing to run for the woods, when suddenly the Tyrannosaur spun back to face him and roared. Grant froze. He was standing beside the passenger door of the Land Cruiser, drenched in rain. He was completely exposed, the Tyrannosaur no more than eight feet away. The big animal roared again. At so close a range, the sound was terrifyingly loud. Whoops, I forgot to... Grant felt himself shaking with the cold and the fright. 
He pressed his trembling hands against the metal door panel to steady them. <clears throat> the Tyrannosaur roared once more, but it did not attack. It cocked its head and looked with first one eye and then the other at the Land Cruiser. And it did nothing. It just stood there. What was going on? The powerful jaws opened and closed. The Tyrannosaur seemed confused. It bellowed angrily, and then the big hind leg came up and crashed down on the roof of the car, and the claws slid off with a metal screech. Bear- oh. Whoops. Sorry. Barely missing him. <clears throat> missing Grant as he stood there, still unmoving. The foot splashed in the mud. The head ducked down in a slow arc, and the animal inspected the car, snorting. It appeared in the front windshield, and then, moving toward the rear, it banged the passenger door closed and moved right towards Grant as he stood there. Grant was dizzy with fear. Sorry, give me one second. Grant was dizzy with fear, his heart pounding inside his chest. With the animal so close, he could smell the rotten flesh in his mouth, the Swedish blood smell and the sickening stench of the creature, of the carnivore. He tensed his body, awaiting the inevitable. But the big head slid past him, toward the rear of the car, and Grant simply blinked. What had happened? Was it possible the Tyrannosaur hadn't seen him? It seemed as if it hadn't, but how could that be? Grant looked back to see the animal sniffing the rear-mounted tire. It nudged the tire with its snout, and then it swung back. Again, it approached Grant. This time, the animal stopped, the black flaring nostrils just inches away. Grant felt the animal's startling hot breath on his face. But the Tyrannosaur wasn't sniffing like a dog. It was just breathing, and if anything, it just seemed puzzled. No, the Tyrannosaur couldn't see him. Not if he stood motionless. And in a, in a detached academic corner of his mind, he found an explanation for that, a reason why... The jaws opened before him, and the massive head raised up. Grant squeezed his fists together and bit his lips, trying desperately to remain motionless and make no sound. <clears throat> the Tyrannosaur bellowed in the night air, but by now Grant was beginning to understand. Oh. The animal couldn't see him, but it suspected he was there, somewhere and was trying with its bellow to frighten Grant into some revealing movement. So long as he stood his ground, Grant realized, he was invisible. In a final gesture of frustration, the big hind leg lifted up and kicked the Land Cruiser over, and Grant felt a searing pain and the surprising sensation of his own body flying through the air. It seemed to be happening very slowly, and he had plenty of time to feel the world turn colder and watch the ground rush up to strike him in the face. <clears throat> All right, sorry about that. That was a bit of a bit of an intense chapter. You know what I mean, folks? It, yeah, it gets a little bit to you, and I'm trying to get these sound effects going. The sound effects didn't work out as well as I wanted them to, unfortunately. But let's go and just say hi to folks and uh, thank some people real quick. And then we're gonna take a short break here so I can get some water. Get out of the mask for a second because it does get hot in here. And then we'll be right back to it. Um, so let's just see what's going on here. <clears throat> uh, starting with Twitch over here. Holy cannoli. So Diesel and Godzilla Greatsword, both of you guys. I can't tell if that was uh, Diesel gifting him the sub. I think that was Diesel gifting him the sub. Either way, Diesel and Godzilla, W for both of you guys. And thank you guys for uh, joining us here tonight. Um, oh, and you started a hype train. Casual guy, it's your boy. I know, I understand. Godzilla Great Sword Man, thank you so very much. And that is an awesome emote. Godzilla Stomp? Holy crap. Godzilla Minus One is awesome. I don't blame you at all. What? Actually, I think the next chapter is Nedry, I believe, casual guy. I know, I know. It's coming very soon. Coming very soon. Thank you to everybody who's here watching. Let's go over and see how, what YouTube's saying. Oh, you guys talking about Sornops? I did not major in public speaking. 
Sorry about that, but, uh, uh, I mean, that wouldn't be a bad idea, but I think Prof is kind of busy. I don't want to bother him with stuff like that. I can't, I can't afford to pay him, you know what I mean? Like, I'm bare, we're figuring it out, but, like, I'm not going to say I'm barely making it, but we're, we're pulling through, we're pulling through. I'm trying to like read everything, but y'all are having like 18 conversations. Okay, let me address you guys right now, YouTube. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Thank you, King Rex. I thought I thought it was kind of funny. Um, Shin in God, Indo Godzilla. Thank you. I think the story's pretty cool too. Hello to everybody here on TikTok. Thank you for that. That's much appreciated. No, you have not missed the Nedry part. I mean, feel free to chit-chat about dinosaurs in the chat. That's what it's here for. Uh, my day has been fairly good. It's been a little long, but, you know, that happens sometimes. Thank you guys for enjoying, uh, for enjoying the content. I'll still be checking the chat here. Just give me one second because we're going to put it in the be right back screen. It looks like you guys can still hear me. We're going to turn that down for the BRB screen. Oh, I almost took it off while you guys could still see me. TikTok, ha ha ha. Not today, not today, not this time. Almost, almost. <clears throat> Oh, sorry. It's only been like 40, 45 minutes and I'm already sweating in that mask. Oh, how are you all doing tonight? Good, good. I'm glad you can hear me. Godzilla Minus One is such a good movie. I don't blame you guys at all. They're making another Back to the Future? That'd be weird. The thing, the thing I like about the original Back to the Future movies is that they were filmed at the same time. Because, you know, that's just how it was. I don't know about a masterpiece, but I'm glad that you enjoy my videos, Yoel. Bar Barney is not evil incarnate. Calm your horses there. God, I hope not. I'm telling you right now, if I accidentally saw that I turned on the cam while, you know, my face was revealed, I'd turn this off and delete the stream. Not even gonna lie. Not even gonna front with you. Yes, I'm very excited for the new T-Rex documentary. Definitely. Christopher Lloyd Webber. Oh, we completed the hype train too? Okay, so, so extra W's for Godzilla Greatsword and Diesel because they also got the hype train going. Extra W's for both of them. Thank you guys very much. Screen record. Oh, I see. I see. Well, hey, hey, hey. You know what? We're going to just try not to show you guys my face then in the first place. How about that? You guys might be able to see, like, my eyes through the mask, but that's about it. But that's been true in a lot of my videos with better lighting. Just because the mask doesn't exactly hide it. 
I'm just usually in a place where there's enough shadows that you guys can't see inside. How's everybody doing? Let's see. Let's see what everybody's talking. You're pulling a Hammond here. Nah, 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 nah. You can't do that to me. You ain't stealing my rice. That sounds ricest. No, I would rather not. Yeah, I did hit 400k yesterday, and I have to say, once again, thank each and every one of you for it, man. I mean, I couldn't have done it without you guys, and I couldn't have gotten here without you guys. So, thank you all very much. I love and appreciate each and every one of you. I'm not Asian Asian, but I'm Indian. Indian's a kind of Asian. I hope not. It's sitting right next to me. If you if you were stealing my mask, I would be kind of kind of concerned. Yeah, I know. Four hundred thousand subs. It's insane, man. I I'm I'm flabbergasted myself. Yes, I do love metal music. Metal music is awesome. Absolutely love it. And it, it depends. I'm not like one of those guys. I know there's like a hundred different types of metal music, but I'm not like. Taldaz, what's up? Thank you for hopping in here. Nice to see you, Taldaz. All right, probably about another minute or so here, and we'll uh, we'll we'll get this back on. Doom music, cheeses. Yeah, you already know it. I would love to do some doom music, man. Do you guys ever played Doom? Either the old ones or the new ones? Doom's a great game. <clears throat> you should. You should. Both Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal is amazing. I don't blame you, tell Daz. It's a uh, they, well, especially as a kid. I mean, they were demons. What do you, what do you want from us? A hundred percent agree. Doom is great, Kilgore. Favorite metal band? Depends on what kind of metal you're talking about. I mean, when I was a kid, like a teenager, my favorite band was Lorna, Sh or not Lorna, Sh Crown the Empire. Um. Sorry, I've been listening to Lorna Shore today, but uh, Crown the Empire was my favorite when I was a kid. Nowadays, I don't know. I mean, usually if I'm listening to metal, it's usually something a little harder than Crown the Empire. I like Crown the Empire, but they're... Mm. Um, it's just not my particular taste as much these days. They're still a great band, though, and some of their songs are unmatched. Uh, but I don't know. There's a lot of bands that I listen to today. It's hard, it's hard to pick. It's hard to pick. Crown the Empire's still up there. Rob Zombie's up there. I've been listening to a lot of Rob Zombie lately. Uh, if I hit a million subs, I don't know. We gotta do something special for a million subs. I've been thinking about it for a while. I hope I reach 500k too. Hopefully before the end of the year. That would be awesome. If I could reach 500k before the end of the year, folks... We we gonna have to do something special for both five hundred K and a mill. Alright, alright. We've been procrastinating enough. Let's get back to it.
I haven't really listened to be much Tool, so or I haven't really listened to much Tool, so I wouldn't know much about Tool. All right, TikTok, you guys are getting set up over here again. Man, what happened there? Alrighty. And then, so TikTok's back. What's up, folks? Hello. And then, live scene. Perfect, perfect. All right. <clears throat> I think, oh, Super Potato. No one better to read the book for us. Oh, thank you so very much, Super Potato. I'm sorry I didn't see this until right now. Guys, give me some W's for Super Potato. Much appreciated. Thank you so very much for the donation. Extra W's for Super Potato in all the chats, please. Fane Babanu, um, Morta, Morta Manimates, RH13, Everyone, thank you for the subscription on YouTube. And just uh, thank thank each and every one of you for being here and watching tonight. Now, let's get back into it, starting with the next chapter. Being D This chapter is titled Dennis Nedry. Oh, never mind. I'm wrong. There is one more chapter before the Dennis Nedry chapter. Ha ha, I was wrong. False information. I think this chapter is a short one, though. My bad. Okay. One in between. One in between. My B, guys. I am so sorry. I should not have awkward or argued. Godzilla Minus One is a 10 out of 10 in my opinion, but all Godzilla movies are a 10 out of 10 in my opinion. No, I will not hear criticisms. Taldaz, I love metal with, like, stuff like that. It's that one guy who's, like... Um, there, I ruined it on TikTok. Love his videos. Tenorous. Okay, okay, I'll keep that in mind. I leave, I leave Twitch for a couple seconds, and there's a whole bunch of you in here chit-chatting. That's a cool hard emote, Godzilla. Alright, alright, sorry. We gotta get through this chapter, and then we can start the chapter for, uh, for Nedry. So this chapter is actually called Return. Oh, damn, Harding said. Will you look at that? They were sitting in Harding's gasoline-powered jeep, staring forward past the flick-flick of the windshield wipers and the yellow flare of the headlamps. A big fallen tree blocked the road. Must have been the lightning, Gennaro said. Hell of a tree. We can't get past it, Harding said. I better tell, I better tell Arnold in control. He picked up the radio and twisted the channel. The channel dial. Hello, John. Can you hear me there, John? There was nothing but a steady, hissing static. I don't understand, he said. The radio lines seem to be down. It must have been the storm, Gennaro said. I suppose. Try the land cruisers, Ellie suggested. Harding opened other channels, but there was no answer on any of them. Nothing, he said. They're probably back to camp by now and outside the range of our little radio set. In any case, I don't think we should stay here until it'll be... It'll be hours before maintenance gets a crew out to remove that tree. He turned the radio off and put the jeep into reverse. <clears throat> Sorry. What are you going to do? Nellie said. Go back to the turnaround and get onto the maintenance road? Fortunately, there's a second road system, Harding explained. We have one on the road we have one road for visitors and a second road for animal handlers and feed trucks and so on. We'll travel back on that maintenance road. It's a little longer, and it's not so scenic, but you may find it interesting. If the rain lets up, we'll get to see a glimpse of some of the animals at night. We should be back in 30, 40 minutes, Harding said, if I don't get lost. He turned the jeep around in the night and headed south again. <clears throat> oh. Remember what for later? Oh, Spaceballs is a good movie. I don't disagree with you there at all. Spaceballs is a fantastic film. That is bright, and not what I meant to do. There we go. That's what I meant to do. 
Lightning flashed and every monitor in the control room went black. Arnold sat forward, his body rigid and tense. Jesus, not now, not now. That was all he needed, to have everything go out now during the storm. All the main power circuits were surge protected, of course, but Arnold wasn't sure about the modems Nedry was using for his data transmissions. Most people didn't know it was possible to blow an entire system through the modem. The lightning pulse cl climbed back into the computer through the telephone line and bang! No more motherboard, no more RAM, no more file server, no more computer. The screens flickered, and then one by one, they came back on. Arnold sighed and collapsed back in his chair. He wondered again where Nedry had gone. Five minutes ago, he'd sent guards to search the building for him. The fat bastard was probably in the bathroom reading a comic book, but the guards hadn't come back and they hadn't called in. Five minutes. If Nedry was in the building, they should have found him by now. Somebody took the damn jeep, Muldoon said as he came back in the room. Have you talked to the land cruisers yet? Can't raise them on the radio, Arnold said. I have, I have to use this because the main board is down. It's weak, but it ought to work. I've tried on all six channels. I know they have radios in the cars, but they're not answering. That's not good, Muldoon said. If you want to go out there, take one of the maintenance vehicles. I would, Muldoon said, but they're all in the east garage, more than a mile from here. Where's Harding? I assume he's on his way back. Then he'll pick up the people in the land cruisers on his way. I assume so. Anybody tell Hammond the kids aren't back yet? Hell no, Arnold said. I don't want that son of a bitch running around in here screaming at me. Everything's all right for the moment. The land cruisers are just stuck in the rain. They can sit a while until Harding brings them back. Or until we find Nedry and make that little bastard turn the systems back on. You can't get them back on, Muldoon said. Arnold shook his head. I've been trying. But Nedry's done something to the system. I can't figure out what, but if I have to cut but if I have to go into the code itself, that'll take hours. We need Nedry. We've got to find the son of a bitch right away. Now we'll get into the chapter called Nedry. <laughs> My complete bad, folks. <clears throat> Hello to everybody hopping in the TikTok. Nice to see some folks in here tonight. Just going between the TikTok to YouTube and whatnot, just checking in, chatting with folks a little bit. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. All right. <clears throat> All right. So this chattel, chap, channel chapter is titled Nedry. The sign said, electric fence, 10,000 volts, do not touch, but Nedry opened it with his bare hand and unlocked the gate, swinging it wide. He went back to the Jeep, drove through the gate, and then walked back to close it behind him. Now he was in the park itself, no more than a mile from the east dock. He stepped on the accelerator and hunched forward over the steering wheel, peering through the rain-slashed windshield as he drove the Jeep down the narrow road. He was driving fast, too fast, but he had to keep to his timetable. He was surrounded on all sides by black jungle, but soon he should be able to see the beach and the ocean off to his left. This damn storm, he thought. He might screw up everything. Because, Do because of, if Dachshund's boat wasn't waiting for him at the east dock when Nedry got there, the whole plan would be ruined. Nedry couldn't wait very long, or he'd be missed back in the control room. The whole idea behind the plan was that he could drive to the east dock, drop off the embryos, and be back in a few minutes before anyone noticed. It was a good plan, a clever plan. Nedry had worked on it carefully, refining every detail. This plan was going to make him a million and a half dollars, 1.5 meg. That was 10 years of income and a single tax-free shot, and it was going to change his life. Nedry had been damn careful, even to the point of making Docs and meet him in San Francisco airport at the last minute with an excuse about wanting to see the money. Actually, Nedry wanted to record his conversation with Dachshund and mention him by name on the tape, just so that Dachshund wouldn't forget he owed the rest of the money. Nedry was including a copy of that tape with the embryos. In short, Nedry had thought of everything. Except this damn storm. <clears throat> Something dashed across the road, a white flash in its headlights. It looked like a large rat. It scurried into the underbrush, dragging a fat tail behind it. A possum. Amazing that a possum could survive here. You'd think the dinosaurs would get an animal like that. Where was the damn dock? He was driving fast, and he had already been gone about five minutes. He should have reached the east dock by now. Had he taken a wrong turn? 
He didn't think so. He hadn't seen any forks in the road at all. Then where was the dock? It was a shock when he came around the corner and saw the road terminated in a gray concrete barrier, six feet tall and streaked dark with rain. He slammed on the brakes and the Jeep fishtailed, losing traction in an end-to-end -end spin. And for a horrified moment, he thought he was going to smash into the barrier. He knew he was going to smash. And he spun the wheel frantically and the Jeep slid to a stop, the headlamps just a foot from the concrete wall. So obviously Nedry thinks he has this all planned out, thinks everything is doing good, whatnot, but uh, it's not doing nearly as good as he thought he was. Oh, not too many people here in TikTok tonight. Um, that's all right. We'll keep going for a little while. If not too many people join on TikTok, then I will end the TikTok live. I'll keep going on YouTube though, don't worry, YouTube and Twitch. <clears throat> but anyways, let us continue. Um, he paused there, listening to the rhythmic flick of the wipers. He took a deep breath and exhaled slowly. He looked back down the road. He'd obviously taken a wrong turn somewhere. He could retrace his steps, but that would take too long. He'd better try and find out where the hell he was. He got out of the Jeep, feeling heavy raindrops batter his head. It was a real tropical storm, raining so hard that it hurt. He glanced at his watch, pushing the button to illuminate the digital dial. Six minutes gone. Where the hell was he? He walked around the concrete barrier and on the other side, along with the rain, he heard the sound of gurgling water. Could it be the ocean? Nedry hurried forward, his eyes adjusting to the darkness as he went. Dense jungle on all sides and raindrops slapping on it on the leaves. <clears throat> The gurgling sound became louder, drawing him forward, and suddenly he came out of the foliage and felt his feet sink into soft earth and saw the dark currents of the river. The river? He was at the jungle river. Damn, he thought. At the river where? The river ran for miles through the island. He looked at his watch again. Seven minutes gone. You have a problem, Dennis, he said aloud. As if in reply... Oop. Whoops. As if in reply, there was a soft, hooting cry of an owl in the forest. Nedry hardly noticed. He was worrying about his plan. The plain fact was the time had run out. There wasn't a choice anymore. He had to abandon his original plan. All he could do was go back to the control room, restore the computer, and somehow try to contact Docs and to set up the drop at the East Dock for the following night. Nedry would have to scramble to make that work, but he thought he could pull it off. The computer automatically logged all calls after Nedry got through to Dachshund. He'd have to go on back into the computer and erase the record of the call. What? What is this? Okay, hold on. One second, folks. It's making me do some verification thing on TikTok. I don't know what that was all about. <clears throat> but one thing was sure he couldn't stay out in the park any longer or his absence would be noticed Nedry started back heading toward the glow of the car's headlights he was drenched and miserable he heard the soft ho and then he heard the soft hooting cry once more and this time he paused that hadn't really sounded like an owl and it seemed to be close by, in the jungle, somewhere off to his left. He waited. He, as he listened, he heard a crashing sound in the underbrush. Then silence. He waited. And then he heard it again. It sounded distinctly like something big, moving slowly towards the jungle to, to, toward him. Something big. Something near. A big dinosaur. Get out of here. Nedry began to run. He made a lot of noise as he ran, but even so, he could hear the animal crashing through the foliage and hooting. It was coming closer. Stumbling over the tree roots in the darkness, clawing his way past dripping branches, he saw the jeep ahead, and the light shining around the vertical wall of the barrier made him feel a little better. In a moment, he'd be up in the car, and he'd get the hell out of here. He'd scrambled around the barrier, 
and then he froze. And the animal was already there. But it wasn't close. The dinosaur stood 40 feet away at the edge of the illumination from the headlamps. Nedry hadn't taken the tour, so he hadn't seen the different types of dinosaurs. But this one was strange looking. The 10 foot tall body was ye yellow with black spots and along the head ran a pair of V-shaped crests. The dinosaur didn't move, but again, it gave its soft, hooting cry. Nedry waited to see if it would attack, but it didn't. Perhaps the headlights from the jeep frightened it, forcing it to keep its distance like a fire. The dinosaur stared at him and then snapped its head with a single swift motion. Nedry felt something smack wetly against his chest. He looked down and saw a glipping drop glob of foam on his rain-choked shirt. He touched it curiously, not fully comprehending that it was spit. But it was spit. The dinosaur had spit on him. It was creepy, he thought. He looked back at the dinosaur and saw the head snap again and immediately felt another wet smack on his neck, just above the shirt collar. He wiped it away with his hand. Jesus, it was disgusting. But the skin of his neck was already starting to tingle and burn, and his hand was tingling too. It was almost like he had been touched with acid. Nedry opened the car door, glancing back at the dinosaur to make sure it wasn't going to attack and felt a sudden, excruciating pain in his eyes. Stabbing like spikes into the back of his skull, and he squeezed his eyes shut and gasped with the intensity of it, and threw up his hands in the air to cover his eyes, and felt the slippery foam trickling down both sides of his nose. Spit. The dinosaur had spit in his eyes, and even as he realized it, the pain overwhelmed him, and he dropped onto his knees, disoriented and wheezing. He collapsed onto his side, his chest pressed to the wet ground, and his breath coming in thin whistles through the constant, ever-screaming pain that caused flashing spots of light to appear behind his tightly shut eyelids. The earth shook beneath him, and Nedry knew the dinosaur was moving. He could hear its soft, hooting cry, and despite the pain, he forced his eyes open, but still he saw nothing but flashing spots against black. And slowly... The realization came to him. He was blind. The hooting was, lo the hooting was louder as Nedry scrambled to his feet and staggered back against the side panel of the car. A wave of nausea and dizziness swept over him. The dinosaur was close. He could feel it coming closer. He was dimly aware of its snorting breath. But he couldn't see. He couldn't see anything, and his terror was extreme. He stretched out his hands, waving them wildly in the air to ward off the attack he knew was coming. And then, there was a new, searing pain, like a fiery knife in his belly. And Nedry stumbled, reaching blindly down to touch the ragged edge of his shirt, and then a thick, slippery mass that was surprisingly warm, and with horror... He suddenly knew that he was holding his own intestines in his hand. The dinosaur had torn him open. His guts had fallen out. Nedry fell to the ground and landed on something scaly and cold. It was the animal's foot. And then there was new pain on both sides of his head. The pain grew worse, and as he was lifted to his feet, he knew the dinosaur had his head in its jaws, and the horror of that realization was followed by a final wish, that it would all be over soon. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, that was the chapter Nedry, and the unfortunate end of Nedry. I know a lot of people don't like him, which is understandable, because he is the villain, but, uh, yeah, that was if that was if for Nedry. All right, let's see what's going on. Let's see what I missed. James Rice, yummy hamburger. I feel like I'm missing one here. Hold on. Green man, thank you guys for subscribing. Much appreciated. I hope everyone is enjoying so far. 
honestly, Taldaz, I don't blame you. It's uh, it's kind of a horrifying chapter, and it really kind of drives home that this is a, a terrifying novel. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very stark contrast to the following chapter, which you guys will hear now. This chapter is called Bungalow. More coffee? Hammond asked politely. No, thank you, Henry Wu said, leaning back in his chair. I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't eat anything more. They were sitting in the dining room in Hammond's bungalow, in a secluded corner of the park not far from the labs. Wu had to admit that the bung bungalow Hammond had built for himself was elegant, with sparse, almost Japanese lines, and the dinner had been excellent, considering the dining room wasn't even fully staffed yet. But there was something about Hammond that Wu found troubling. The old man was different in some way, subtly different. All during dinner, Wu had to tried to decide what it was, in part, a tendency to ramble, to repeat himself, to retell old stories. In part, it was an emotional liability, flaring anger one moment, Malden sent sentimentality the next. But all that could be understood as a natural concomitant con of age. I don't know if that's a real word. But a natural progression of age. John Hammond was, after all, 77. But there was something else. A stubborn evasiveness. An insistence on having his way and in the end, a complete refusal to deal with the situation that now faced the park. Wu had been stunned by the evidence. He did not allow himself to believe that the case was proved, but that the dinosaurs were breeding. After Grant had asked about amphibian DNA, Wu had intended to go directly to his laboratory and check the computer records and various DNA assemblies, because if the dinosaurs were in fact breeding, then everything about Jurassic Park was called into question. Their genetic development methods, their genetic control methods, everything. Even the lysine dependency might be suspect. And if these animals could truly breed and could truly survive in the wild, Henry Wu wanted to check the data at once. But Hammond had stubbornly insisted Wu accompany him to dinner. Now then, Henry, you must save some room for ice cream, Hammond said, pushing back from the table. Maria makes the most wonderful ginger ice cream. <clears throat> All right, Wu said, and looked at the beautiful, silent serving girl. His eyes followed her out of the room, and then he glanced at the single monitor mounted on the wall. The monitor was dark. Your monitor's out, Wu said. Is it? Hammond glanced over. Ah, must be the storm. He reached behind him for the telephone. I'll check with John in control. Wu, heard, Wu could hear the static crackle on the telephone line. Hammond shrugged and set the receiver back in its cradles. Ah, line must be down, he said. Or may, maybe Nedry's still doing data transmission. He has had quite a few bugs to fix this weekend. Nedry's a genius in his own way, but we had to press him quite hard toward the end to make sure he got things exactly right. Perhaps I should go back to the control room and check. No, no, Hammond said. There's no reason. If there was any problem, we'd hear about it. Ah, Maria came back into the room with two plates of ice cream. You must have just a little, Henry. It's made from fresh ginger from east part of the from the eastern part of the island. I can't do a good British accent. I'm sorry. You must have just a little, Henry. It's made from fresh ginger from the eastern part of the island. It's an old man's vice ice cream, but still. Dutifully, Wu dipped his spoon. Outside, lightning flashed, and then there was a sharp crack of thunder. That was close, Wu said. I hope the storm isn't frightening the children. Oh, I shouldn't think so, Hammond said. He tasted the ice cream. But I can't help but hold some fears about this park, Henry. Inwardly, Wu felt relief. Perhaps the old man was going to face the truth after all. What kind of fears? You know, Jurassic Park's really made for children. The children of the world would love dinosaurs, and the children are going to, let, to delight, are going to delight, just delight in this place. Their little faces would shine with the joy of finally seeing these wonderful animals. But I'm afraid I may not be alive to see it, Henry. I may not live to see the joy on their faces. I think there are other problems too, Wu said, frowning. But none so pressing on my mind as this, Hammond said, that I may not live to see their shining, delighted faces. This is our triumph, this park. We have done what we set out to do. 
And you remember, our original intent was to use newly emerging technology of genetic engineering to make money. A lot of money. <clears throat> Wu knew Hammond was about to launch into one of his old speeches. He held up his hand. I'm familiar with this, John. If you were going to start a bioengineering company, Henry, what would you do? Would you make products to help mankind? To fight illness and disease? Dear me, no, that's a terrible idea. A very poor use of new technology. Hammond shrugged and shook his head sadly. Yet, you'll remember, he said, the original genetic engineering companies like Genentech and Cetus were all started to make pharmaceuticals. New drugs for mankind. Noble, noble purpose. Unfortunately, drugs face all kinds of barriers. FDA testing alone takes five to eight years, if you're lucky. Even worse, there are no forces at work in the marketplace. Suppose you make a miracle drug for cancer or heart disease, as Genentech did. Suppose you now want to charge $1,000 or $2,000 a dose. You might imagine that is your privilege. After all, you invent the drugs, you pay to develop and test it. You should be able to charge whatever you wish. But do you really think that the government will let you do that? No, Henry, they will not. Sick people aren't going to pay $1,000 a dose for needed medication, and they won't be grateful, they'll be outraged. Blue Cross isn't going to pay it, they'll scream highway robbery. So something will happen. Your patent application will be denied, your permits will be delayed, something will force you to see reason, and you'll sell your drug at a lower, end the, at a lower cost in the end. From a business standpoint, that makes helping mankind a very risky business. Personally, I would never help mankind. Wu had heard the argument before, and he knew Hammond was right. Some new bioengineered pharmaceuticals had indeed suffered inexplicable delays and patent problems. Now, Hammond said, this is how different it is when you're making entertainment. Nobody needs entertainment. There's not a matter for government intervention. If I charge $5,000 a day for a park, who's going to stop me? After all, nobody needs to come here. And far from being highway robbery, a co highway robbery, a costly price tag actually increases the appeal of the park. A visit becomes a status symbol, and all Americans love that. So do the Japanese, and of course, they have far more money. Hammond finished his ice cream, and Maria silently took the dish away. She's not from here, you know. She's a Haitian. Her mother is French. But in any case, Henry, you will recall that the original purpose behind pointing my company in this direction in the first place was to have the freedom from government intervention anywhere in the world. Speaking of the rest of the world, Hammond smiled. We've already leased a large tract in the Azores for Jurassic Park Europe, and you know long ago we and you know we long ago obtained an island near Guam for Jurassic Park Japan. Construction on the next two Jurassic Parks will begin early next year. It will all be open within four years. And in that time, direct revenue will exceed $10 billion a year. Merchandising, television, and ancillary rights should double that. I see no reason to bother with children's pets, which I'm told Lewis Dogson thinks we're planning to make. $20 billion a year, Wu said softly, shaking his head. That's speaking conservatively, Hammond said. There's no reason to speculate wildly. More ice cream, Henry? Did you find him? Arnold snapped when the guard walked back into the control room. No, Mr. Arnold. Find him. I don't think he's in the building, Mr. Arnold. Then look in the lodge, Arnold said. Look in the maintenance building. Look in the utility shed. Look everywhere, but just find him. The thing is, the guard hesitated. Mr. Nedry is the fat man, is that right? That's right, Arnold said. He's fat. A fat slob. Well, Jimmy down in the main lobby said he saw a fat man go into the garage. Not Muldoon spun around. Into the garage? When? About 10, 15 minutes ago? Jesus, Muldoon said. The jeep screeched to a stop. Sorry, Harding said. In the headlamps, Ellie saw a herd of Apatosaurus lumbering across the road. There were six animals, each the size of a house, and a baby as large as a full-grown horse. The Apatosaurus moved in unhurried silence never looking toward the jeep and its glowing headlamps. At one point, the baby stopped to lap water from a puddle in the road and then moved on. A comparable herd of elephants would have, start, would have been startled by the arrival of a car, would have trumpeted and circled to protect the baby. But these animals showed no fear. Do they see us? She said. Not exactly, no, Harding said. 
Of course, in a literal sense, they do see us, but we don't really mean anything to them. We hardly ever take cars out at night, so they have no experience of them. We're just a strange, smelly object in their environment, representing no threat and therefore no interest. I've occasionally been out at night visiting a sick animal, and on my way back, these fellows blocked the road for about an hour or so. What do you do? Harding grinned. I play a recorded Tyrannosaur roar. That gets them moving. Not, not that they care too much about the Tyrannosaurus. These Apatosaurus are so big, they don't really have any predators. They can break a Tyrannosaur's neck with a swipe of their tail, and they know it. So does the Tyrannosaur. But they do see us, I mean. If we were to get out of the car, Harding shrugged, they probably wouldn't react. Dinosaurs have excellent visual acuity, but they have basic amphibian visual system. It's attuned to movement. They don't seem unmoving things very well at all. The animals moved on, their skin glittering in the rain. Harding put the car into gear. I think we can continue now. Wu said, I suspect you might find there are more pressures on your park, just as there are pressures on Genetech's drugs. He and Hammond had moved to the living room, and they were now watching the storm lash the big glass windows. I can't see how, Hammond said. The scientists may wish to constrain you, even to stop you. Well, they can't do that, Hammond said. He shook his finger at Wu. You know why the scientists would try to do that? It's because they want to do research, of course. That's all they ever want to do, is research. Not to accomplish anything, not to make any progress, just to do research. Well, they have a surprise coming to them. I wasn't thinking of that, Wu said. Hammond sighed. I'm sure it would be interesting for the scientists to do research, but you arrive at the point where these animals are simply too expensive to be used for research. This is wonderful technology, Henry, but it's also frightfully expensive technology. The fact is, it can only be supported as entertainment. Hammond shrugged. That's just the way it is. But if there are attempts to close down, face the damn facts, Henry, Hammond said irritably. This isn't America. This isn't even Costa Rica. This is my island. I own it, and nothing is going to stop me from opening Jurassic Park to all the children of the world. He chuckled. Or, at least, to the rich ones. And I tell you, Henry, they'll love it. In the back of the jeep, Ellie Sattler stared out the window. They had been driving through the dr rain-drenched jungle for the last 20 minutes and had seen nothing since the apatosaurs crossed the road. We're nearing the jungle river now, Harding said as he drove. It's off there somewhere to our left. Abruptly, he slammed on the brakes again. The car skidded to a stop in, the front, in front of a flock of small green animals. Well, you're getting quite a show tonight, he said. Those are copies. Procomsognathids, Ellie thought, wishing that Grant was here to see them. These were the animals they had seen in the facts back in Montana. The little dark green procomsognathids scurried through the side of the road, then squatted on their hind legs to look at the car, chittering briefly before hurrying onward into the night. Odd, Harding said. Wonder where they're off, wonder where they're off to. Copies don't move, usually move at night, you know. They climb up a tree and wait for daylight. Then why are they out now? I can't imagine. You know, copies are scavengers, like buzzards. They're attracted to dying animals, and they have a tremendously sensitive sense of smell. They can smell a dying animal for miles. Then they're going to a dying animal? Dying? They're already dead. Should we follow them? I'd be curious. Yeah, why not? Let's go see what they're going. You turn the car around and headed back to the copies. All right, folks, we're going to take a pause there for a bit. I wouldn't mind doing a shorter stream tonight, honestly, folks. <clears throat> we can read one more chapter after this. How's everybody doing tonight? Watching, But there's not a lot of you, so you guys over on TikTok, I'm going to end it here for you tonight, folks. And uh, make sure, please, go check me out on YouTube and, uh, and Twitch. Thank you all very much. And now. Perfect. All right. I just ended the TikTok live. I'm not ending us quite yet. We'll do a bit of a shorter stream tonight, though. If that's all right by you folks. Yeah, it seems like most of you guys are okay with it. Thank you for being okay with it. We will. We will. We'll read one more. I promise. We'll read one more. I'm still going to take a little break here. Put us on the Be Right Back screen. 
Uf, da. It was the heat of the moment. I can feel it and it. The heat of the moment. Hey, that's nice, hit you boy. Ghostbuster Spirits Unleashed. I've heard that's kind. Of, I've heard that's pretty fun. I understand it. I I don't care. I or I don't know because I mean honestly, it is a pretty horrifying scene overall. How's everybody doing over in the YouTube chat? Coming over to see here. Donna Rama, it's actually Big Alice, I believe, is what she's called. Not Big Alexis. I think it's Big Alice. I need to refill my water bottle. Give me just one second here, folks. To the Houston Museum? No, I have not been to the Houston Museum. You guys maybe will get a face reveal one day. Definitely ain't happening today. Sorry, folks. Doom is about... Oh, you said what's Doom about? Uh, Doom is uh, is about um, a guy who kills a lot of demons. I mean, there's a lot of lore behind it. I don't, I don't want to go too far into the Doom lore because there's, like, genuinely a surprising amount of lore behind, like, Doom guy and his whole situation. But it's about... Do <laughs> Maybe not unrestrained capitalism, but uh, it's about the, a guy who likes guns and hates demons, and he goes around killing demons. I don't believe they have fangs, no. Beat Charlie who? You mean like Moist Critical Charlie or? I don't know what uh, what little Godzilla is. I'm assuming it's like a kid Godzilla. From are you talking about Manila? Because Manila was the OG kid Godzilla from back in the day. I get it, speaker. I agree. If a demon killed my bunny, I'm right there with you. I'm, I'm, I'm a.
Yes, I'll give you that, Taldas, 100%. Ca unrestrained capitalism is the catalyst for it, for sure. Hey, you could say Manila is ugly, but Manila becomes Godzilla, doesn't he? Hold on, chat. You're literally going to make me look at Manila right now. I guess not. Huh, for some reason I thought Manila, or the original Godzilla, died and his son took his place. Is there another Godzilla kid? Is there like a Godzilla Jr. or something like that? Is that what I'm missing out here? That was hit. Okay, okay. I mean, I enjoy Godzilla Minus One. I, ha I guess I haven't seen too many movies, to be honest with you. Oh, that was Heisei Air. Okay. Manila's from which era? Is that Showa? Doesn't Manila show up in Final Wars, though? Godzuki's a dragon. Okay. I forgot that he had a kid named Godzuki at some point, too. Godzilla have too many kids, man. He had, like, just as many kids as... Alright, I'm not gonna make that joke. I'm not gonna make that joke, but... Alright, relax there, friendly anime chick. All right, folks, we're going to come back here in just a moment. I don't know if you guys watch Flash Kids, but that, that literally just reminded me of one of Flash Kids' memes. Flash Kids is a hilarious YouTube channel, so if you guys... Oh, Godzuki is Hanna-Barbera? Okay. Is Jur Lego Jurassic World canon? <laughs> I, I don't know. I would think not. I'm just taking a pause for a second, Chad. But I'm about to come right back. <coughs> <coughs> I had to sneeze for a second, sorry. <clears throat> All right. There we go. Bada bing, bada boom. Let's get back to it, chat. Shall we? This next chapter, we're going back to Tim. And if it's a short chapter, I might read one or two more. We'll see. Tim Murphy lay in the Land Cruiser, his cheek pressed against the car door handle. He drifted slowly back to consciousness. He wanted only to sleep. He shifted his position and felt the pain in his cheekbone where it lay against the metal door. His whole body ached. His arms and legs and most of all his head. There was a terrible pounding pain in his head. 
The pain made him want to go back to sleep. He pushed himself up on one elbow, opened his eyes, and retched, vomiting all over his shirt. He tasted sour bile and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. He then th His head throbbed, and he felt dizzy and seasick, as if the world were moving, as if he were rocking back and forth on a boat. Tim groaned and rolled onto his back, turning away from the puddle of vomit. The pain in his head made him breathe in short, shallow gasps, and he still felt sick, as if everything were moving. He opened his eyes and looked around, trying to get his bearings. He was inside the Land Cruiser, but the car must have flipped over onto its side because he was laying on his back against the passenger door, looking up at the steering wheel and beyond at the branches of a tree moving in the wind. The rain had nearly stopped, but the water drop still fell on him through the broken front windshield. He stared curiously at the fragments of glass. He couldn't remember how the windshield had broken. He couldn't remember anything except that the car had been parked up on the road and he had been talking to Dr. Grant when the Tyrannosaur came toward them. That was the last thing he remembered. He felt sick again and closed his eyes until the nausea passed. He was aware of a rhythmic creaking sound, like the rigging of a boat. Dizzy and sick to his stomach, he really felt as if the whole car were moving beneath him. But when he opened his eyes, he saw it was, the, he saw it was true. The Land Cruiser was moving lying on its side, swaying back and forth. The whole car was moving. Tentatively, Tim rose to his feet. Standing on the passenger door, he peered over the dashboard, looking out through the shattered windshield. At first, he saw only dense foliage moving in the wind. But here and there, he could see gaps, and beyond, fol and beyond the foliage, the ground, was, the ground was 20 feet below him. He stared uncomprehendingly. The Land Cruiser was laying on its side in the branches of a large tree, 20 feet above the ground, swaying back and forth in the wind. Oh shit, he said. What was he going to do? He stood on his tiptoes and peered out, trying to see better, grabbing the steering wheel for support. The wheel spun free in his hand, and with a loud crack, the cruiser shifted position, dropping a few feet in the branches of the tree. He looked down at the shattered glass of the passenger window on the ground below. Oh shit, oh shit, he kept repeating, oh shit, oh shit. Another loud crack, and the loud Land Cruiser jolted down another foot. He had to get out of here. He looked down at his feet. He was standing on the door handle. He crouched back down on his hands and knees and looked at the handle. He couldn't see very well in the dark, but he could tell that the door was dented outward so the handle couldn't turn. He'd never get the door open. He tried to roll the window down, but the window was stuck too. Then he thought of the back door. Maybe he could open that. He leaned over the front seat, and the Land Cruiser lurched with the shift in weight. Carefully, Tim reached back and twisted the handle on the rear door. It was stuck, too. How is he going to get out? He heard a snorting sound and looked down. A dark shape passed below him, but it wasn't the Tyrannosaur. The shape was tubby, and it made a kind of snuffling as it waddled along. The tail flopped back and forth, and Tim could see the long spikes on the end. It was the stegosaur, apparently recovered from its illness. <clears throat> Sorry, folks, just adjusting. Uh, da -da. Tim wondered where the other people were, Gennaro and Sattler and the vet. He had last seen them at, near the stegosaur. How long ago was that? He looked at his watch, but the face was cracked. He couldn't see the numbers. He took the watch off and tossed it aside. Remember that for later. Not necessarily right now, but later. <clears throat> Probably on one of the next episodes. The stegosaur snuffled and moved on. Now the only sound was the wind in the trees and the creaking of the land cruiser as it shifted back and forth. He had to get out of here. Tim grabbed the handle, tried to force it, but it was stuck solid. It wouldn't move at all. Then he realized what was wrong. The rear door was locked. Tim pulled up the pin and twisted the handle. The rear door swung open, downward, and came to rest against the branches a few feet below. The, the opening was narrow, but Tim thought he could wriggle through it. Holding his breath, he crawled slowly back into the rear seat. The Land Cruiser creaked, but held its position. Gripping the door panel, the door posts on either side, 
Tim slowly lowered himself down through the narrow, angled opening of the door. Soon, he was lying flat on his stomach on the slanted door, his legs sticking out of the car. He kicked in the air. His feet touched something solid, a branch, and he rested his weight against it. As soon as he did, the branch bent down and the door swung wider, spilling him out of the Land Cruiser, and he fell. Leaves scratched his face, his body bouncing from branch to branch, a jolt, searing pain, bright light in his head. He slammed to a stop. The wind knocked out of him. Tim lay doubled over against a large branch, his stomach burning in pain. <clears throat> Tim heard another crack and looked up at the Land Cruiser, a big dark shape five feet above him. Another crack and the car shifted. Tim forced himself to move, to climb down. He used to like to climb trees. He was a good tree climber, and this was a good tree to climb. The branches spaced close together, almost like a staircase. Crack. The car was definitely moving. Tim scrambled downward, slipping over the wet branches, feeling sticky sap on his hands, hurrying. He had not descended more than a few feet when the Land Cruiser creaked a final time, and then slowly, very slowly, nosed over. Tim could see the big green grill in the front headlights swinging down at him, and then the Land Cruiser fell free, gaining momentum as it rushed, hand him, rushed toward him, slamming against the branch where Tim had just been, and it stopped. His face just inches from the dented grill, bent inward like an evil mouth, headlamps for eyes, oil dripped onto Tim's face. He was still 12 feet above the ground. He reached down, found another branch, and moved down. Above, he saw the branch bending under the weight of the Land Cruiser, and then it crackled, and the Land Cruiser came rushing down toward him, and he knew he could never escape it. He could never get down fast enough, so Tim just let it go. He fell the rest of the way. Oh yeah, this will be the last chapter for sure. Tumbling, banging, feeling every pain in every part of his body, hearing the Land Cruiser smashing down through the branches after him like a pursuing animal, and then Tim's shoulder hit the soft ground, and he rolled as hard as he could and pressed his body against the trunk of the tree as the Land Cruiser tumbled down with a loud metallic crash. And a, sudden hot, and a sudden hot burst of electrical sparks that stung his skin and sputtered and sizzled on the wet ground around him. Slowly, Tim got to his feet. In the darkness, he heard the snuffling and saw the stegosaur coming back, apparently attracted by the crash of the Land Cruiser. The dinosaur moved dumbly, and the low head thrust forward, and the big cartilaginous piece plates running in two rows along the back of its hump. Uh, running in two, lows, two rows along the hump of the back. It behaved like an overgrown tortoise, stupid like that, and slow, which isn't necessarily true. We don't necessarily think that Stegosaurus was any more stupid than other dinosaurs. It may not have necessarily had a brain, but stupid is kind of a broad term. They're, they're capable of more than people give them credit for, you know what I mean? <clears throat> Tim picked up a rock and threw it. Get away! The rock thunked dully off the plates, and the stegosaur kept coming. Go on, go! He threw another rock and hit the stegosaur in the head. The animal grunted, turned slowly away, and shoveled off in the direction it had come. Tim leaned against the crumpled land cruiser and looked around in the darkness. He had to get back to the others, but he didn't want to get lost. He knew he was somewhere in the park, probably not far from the main road. If he could only get his bearings, he couldn't see much in the dark, but... And then he remembered the goggles. He climbed through the shattered front windshield with, into the Land Cruiser and found the night vision goggles and the radio. The radio was broken and silent, so he left it behind, but the goggles still worked. He flicked them on and saw the reassuringly familiar phosphorescent green image. Wearing the goggles, he saw the battered fence off to his left and walked toward it. The fence was 12 feet high, but the Tyrannosaur had flattened it easily. Tim hurried across it, moved through an area of dense foliage, and came out onto the main road. Through his goggles, he saw the other Land Cruiser turned on its side. He ran toward it, took a breath, and looked inside. The car was empty. No sign of Dr. Grant or Dr. Malcolm. Where had they gone? Where had everybody gone?
<clears throat> he felt sudden panic standing alone in the jungle road at night with the empty car and turned quickly in circles, seeing the bright green world in the goggles swirl. Something pale by the side of the road caught his eye. It was Lex's baseball. He picked it up and wiped the mud off of it. Lex! Tim shouted as loud as he could, not caring if the animals heard him. He listened, but there was only wind and the plink of raindrops falling from the trees. Lex! He vaguely remembered that she had been in the Land Cruiser when the Tyrannosaur attacked. Had she stayed there, or had she gotten away? The, the events of the attack were confused in his mind. He wasn't exactly sure what had happened. Just to think of it made him uneasy. He just stood in the road, gasping with pain. Lex! The night seemed to close in around him. Feeling sorry for himself, he sat in a cold, rainy puddle in the road and whimpered for a while. When he finally stopped, he still heard whimpering. It was faint, and it was coming from somewhere further up the road. How long has it been, Muldoon said, coming back into the control room. He was carrying a black metal case. Half an hour. Harding's Jeep should be back here by now. Arnold stubbed out a cigarette. I'm sure it'll arrive at any minute now. Still no sign of Nedry, Muldoon said. No, not yet. Muldoon opened the case, which contained six portable radios. I'm going to distribute these among people in the building. He handed one to Arnold. Take the charger, too. These are our emergency radios, but nobody had, had them plugged in, naturally. Let it charge about 20 minutes and then try to raise the cars. Henry Wu opened the door marked fertilization and entered the darkened lab. There was nobody here. Apparently all the technicians were still at dinner. <clears throat> Wu went directly to the computer terminal and punched up the DNA logbooks. The logbooks had to be kept on computer. DNA was such a large molecule that each species required 10 gigabytes of optical disk space to store details of all the interactions. He was going to have to check all 15 species. That was a tremendous amount of information to search through. He still wasn't clear about why Grant thought frog DNA was important. Wu himself didn't often distinguish one kind of DNA from another. After all, most DNA in living creatures was exactly the same. DNA was an incredibly ancient substance. Human beings walking around on the streets of the modern world, bouncing their pink new babies, hardly stopped to think about that that substance at the center of it all. The substance that began, began the dance of life was a chemical almost as old as the Earth itself. The DNA molecule was so old that its evolution had essentially finished more than two billion years ago. There had been little new since that time, just a few recent combinations of the old genes, and not much of that. <clears throat> when you compared the the DNA of a man and the DNA of a lowly bacterium, you only found about a 10% difference of the strands that were in the strands. The inmate, the innate conservation, sorry folks. The innate conservatism of DNA emboldened Wu to use whatever DNA he wished. In making his dinosaurs, Wu had manipulated the DNA as a sculptor might clay or marble he had created freely. He started the computer search program knowing it would take three minutes or more to run. He got up and walked around the lab, checking instruments out of the long-standing habit. He noted that the recorder outside of the freezer door which tracked the freezer temperature. He saw there was a spike in the graph. That was odd, he thought. It meant that somebody had been in the freezer. Recently, too, within the last half hour. But who would go in there at night? The computer beeped, signaling that the first of the data searches was complete. Wu went over to see what it had found, and when he saw the screen, he forgot all about the freezer and the graph spike. So, this is just a little chart that shows which dinosaurs had frog DNA in them. Um, you can see it here. Uh, and if you guys watched my last episode from last week, you'll note that all these animals, myosaurs, procomsignathids, othonelia, velociraptor, and hypsilophodonts, all were the animals speculated to be breeding. And Grant said to check for frog or amphibian DNA. He did that, and all the animals that were breeding, breeding all had frog or amphibian DNA. <clears throat> the result was clear. All breeding dinosaurs incorporated rana or frog DNA. None of the animals did. Wu did still not 
still did not understand why this had caused them to breed, but he could no longer deny that Grant was right. The dinosaurs were breeding. He hurried up to the control room. And that, folks, is where we'll end it for the night. Next week, we will start with the next chapter, which is titled Lex. Let's just uh, thank you, Jay Gopsis, Stephen Page, and Kyle Smith for subscribing. Much appreciated. <clears throat> let's uh, let's just get in here and talk to folks. How's everybody doing tonight? Twitch, how are you guys doing before I get off? Will, casual guy, thank you guys very much. It was me, Barry. I spoiled your milk. Oh, man. T-Rex was, was Shepard all along? I'm so confused. All right, all right. Unsupervised, but... Oh. Oh, God. All right, casual guy. Will you have a great night, and everybody have a great night here? I hope you were enjoying yourself playing Path of Titans. I'll be playing Path of Titans next week on Tuesday. Um, I'll also be playing another episode of Elden Ring next week. So make sure to stay tuned for that. Oh, dang. I didn't even notice my box was all messed up this stream chat. I'm so sorry about that. I'll make sure to fix that next week. But either way, I hope you guys have a fantastic night. Remember to be good people, and I will see each and every one of you, hopefully, on the next one.